for his articles, edited books, and journal editions. His recent book, Transnational Neo-Fascism in France and Italy, is published by Cambridge University Press. He is now writing a book about <coughs> the contemporary nationalist turn in Europe. He has written for the Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, The Guardian, The New York Times, Reuters, Al Jazeera, CNN, and Foreign Affairs, among others. Andrea, welcome. the Atlantic of this because it is one of the I have to say many places where I've been invited to talk about the situation in Europe on the far right side or on populism or anti-establishment. As you will probably see I have a different approach, uh, different from some people here in terms of uh, the way that we should label this type of movement, especially in Europe, especially on the far right wing side. So, uh, I think that we need to get something about what is Europe today and where is Europe today. So, if we think about the last two years, because one of the problems in Europe is that there are too many problems in Europe at once, and, you know, more the time is going over, on, and there are even additional burdens arriving in Europe. So, we have uh, Greek people protesting in one of the pictures, we have some of the... Uh, refugees or people trying, trying to migrate in Europe with the solution of building war, walls which in any case will not stop them as we know because the problems are much higher than, uh, than building walls then we have uh, protest against Angela Merkel even in the rich Germany uh, which thought to be immune in some ways to some of this rhetoric and then we had this uh, now famous or unfamous, depends on, on the, uh, the idea that so someone has about the Brexit referendum before the actual Brexit vote, because the Brexit referendum has been important itself. Uh, we also had terrorist attack in Europe, as we all know, and we have people protesting or, I mean, this, this is, uh, these pictures are in Brussels. There was the day of mourning for one of the terrorist attacks, and this peaceful demonstration of people so being there, uh, you know, to paying an homage <coughs> to the victim was disrupted by these uh, neo fascist far right hardliners going there and started. I mean, the, the, then the police have arrived. This, I, we have to say, this failing Belgian, Belgian police. <laughs> because they've been unable to do many of the things that had to be done, and this is part of another problem in Europe. Uh, and so this is a very complex situation in Europe. Now, we have two solutions, probably. Or we destroy it, or we try to keep to improve it. Now, my tendency is uh, that we should actually, now, in a difficult time for Europe, we should need to keep in mind why Europe is still relevant, possibly, today. And I prepared a couple of slides. What is happening today, also look at the images, which I just showed, the first, the first slide, is that this is, as we will see, an economically austere Europe and politically nationalist. So pushing for a sort of nostalgic return to this idea of national states or borders. Now, borders, as we know, are very difficult and, 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 and complex concept because we can analyze them culturally it, it, they have to do with identity this is a center for Italian studies in America and there are many Italian Americans so the idea of identity is very complex in reality so why Europe matters and what's Europe is this so what are we are uh, having today so uh, even if today Europe is as we have seen uh, previously with some of the presentation extremely unpopular I mean, if you talk today about uh, who is responsible for this, 
the European Union <laughs> or some of the establishment. Uh, even if we tend to forget that Europe has, despite many problems, uh, has some common roots. The name Europa came from, from the Greek language, as we know. There are strong traditions with the Roman Empire and so on, where for the first time we geographically have this Europe in our mind. So at school we know that the biggest empire was the Roman one, and it was actually controlling most of the Europe, most of the, of the known world. But Europe is important because we are in a university, and this is a European legacy. Universities were a product, or by product, of European culture. And they were transnational universities. They were called Studium Generale. So a university or someone who was adding this title, Studium Generale, was able to grant degrees valid for the whole European lands. So we're talking about the Middle Ages, when it was not English, but it was Latin, <laughs> the, the language of, of culture and of exchanges. Then Enlightenment, the reason, which is actually challenged today, and then this is still, I believe, at least this is my perspective, a transnational Europe. So commonalities are often stronger than divisions. We have an institutional side. What people tend to forget is that, despite the fact that the European Union is probably not working as it should, and this is clear, but uh, people tend to analyze, in this case, wrongly, because what I want to say, I mean, I may be criticized for this, but uh, European history has not started with the financial crisis. There was a war before. We shouldn't forget what happened from 1945 to the financial crisis, when in Europe we had, for the first time, a period of peace. We were coming out from the Second World War. I don't need to explain this <laughs> because you know everyone knows about this. So the European Union, despite all the problems that they had, they've been able to guarantee a post-nationalism world. And this is probably the first success. Indeed, even countries like Italy, for example, or Germany, rather than being punished, have been integrating also with the American, because this was the American policy as well, have been integrated in a new international European context, rather than being punished. Because we know that the problem when you punish countries like Germany after the First World War is the risk is that national resentments and something may get wrong at some point. So in any case, the European Union has been able to create a sort of a somewhat positive environment when, let's forget, I mean, let's keep in, into consideration that Europe today is problematic, I believe so, but I mean, it's not that we need to, work, we need to go back to, I don't know, 1950, <coughs> to here in Italy, that you know, being part of the European community was very good. It's something that it was up to the financial crisis and some of the policies implemented in Europe that many people, were believing that the European community, then European Union, was something positive to be. Now, this Europe, and I think it is one of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons that then can help us to understand why the, the, the far right has been rising and is surviving, is that this Europe, as we knew it, was a different type of Europe than today. So even the previous speakers and myself, often we're talking about a world which today is not existing anymore. We are not existing in this post-1945 Europe, social democracy, this idea of Scandinavia and so on, where you know, even, with, even with the push, despite the push of the United States, a sort of liberal market was there together with labor protection huge welfare state for a number of good reasons in Europe, also because you need to make a, you need to contrast what was happening in the communist Europe, which was a gigantic welfare state, so you needed something in Western Europe as well. So this was a, a kind of Europe that in many ways is not existing anymore. And I will tell you, at least in my perspective, why. But this was also a, an anti-fascist Europe. So what people tend to forget that there are many constitutions 
basic laws which have been created or changed or modified after 1945, and they're anti-fascist. For anti-fascism, I mean also a culture which has been able to create a sort of consensus in the way of rebuilding Europe after the war, where there was no real place in politics. And I'm not talking here about only a militant anti-fascism, so people going and fighting with the, the fascist, the, Possible fascists on the street. I'm saying, in terms of mainstream, there was a clear, even if obviously I cannot generalize, but a clear anti fascist culture there. So, what we should ask, I use the, 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 the image of a book of one of my colleagues at, at Royal Holloway, is that should we start asking if bye bye? So, <laughs> we are talking about different stories, it would be impossible to go back. And what is happening today is because we, you know, there has been changes in the Western globe and certainly in the European globe. I don't know that it's very hard. I mean, it is in workshops that we can see different perspectives and people trying to reflect on some of these themes which are extremely big and cannot be analyzed from a single standpoint. But certainly there is something which I invite you to think about. So, are we talking about a world we, as people from, let's say, a number of generations, but certainly not kids, <laughs> talking about war, a world that we were used to and now is another galaxy? So, the title of my paper is We Are the Future. The, uh, got used to it was a, was a, a We Are the Future was a, sent was a sentence uh, that Gert Wilders, the Dutch leader, the one with the, uh, the what's up there? <laughs> uh, uh, he said at a meeting in January in Milano, in Italy, this was the first meeting of Eurocognition and Freedom Group. It is the official party uh, group, the, let's say what I call far right as a terminology, in the European Parliament. Then, in any case, the first meeting in Milano. It was in January last year. Now, uh, being part of uh, for them, even if they are anti-Europe, but for them, having numbers to create an official party group means funding, means money. Money which can be used to advertise your idea, to spread your message, and we're talking about here lots of public money. So, they want to destroy Europe, but they use the European money to spread their anti-EU message. But this is something extremely relevant, which, unfortunately, to say, some people tend to forget or <laughs> they believe that this is not existing. And this is problematic, and I will tell you a twist in a view why. So, some of these parties share some common themes, like defending the territory, religion, tradition, anti-immigration, Islam, and anti-EU. Now, uh, it has been uh, quite common to say that you know nationalism cannot cooperate at an international level, which in some ways is true. But what we tend to forget is that far-right parties, fascist parties, neo-fascist parties have been collaborating all over. So there is historical evidence that they tried to build international organizations, that they were traveling, they were talking to each other. And so there is an evidence that they can actually build links. And today, with the internet and social media, is even easier because there are not only those parties in the European Parliament, but there is a far-right culture which is underground, which is online, which is made by football hooligans, for example, which is made through music, uh, and so on. So there are so many levels today that probably we have not been able to, uh, not to counter them, but to see them. They are led internationally by the Front National, these parties. So now, I, I use here part of the program of Marine Le Pen uh, for the presidential elections. Uh, these are the, this is the program, 144 proposals. Uh, one second. Okay, these are some of the proposals. So what the, it can be summarized uh, with this sentence. Uh, uh, with this label, they call it national priority. 
and they want to put this in constitution. So imagine a state, a democratic state, open to multiculturalism and so on, as France has been so far, uh, willing, according to them, of course, willing to put this into the constitution. So priority to the nation. And I will tell you why, what is this nation. So these are some of the, uh, some of the proposals. So out of the, of the NATO, uh, defense budget up, of course, out of the EU, no wild globalization. Now, why we can agree about this no wild globalization? Well, we tend to forget that uh, French multinationals are, are everywhere. So <laughs> if they stop globalization, they should stop their own uh, uh, multinational companies, and I don't know how it will work. So maybe they want to prevent others to come to France, but they are happy to have French companies <laughs> going abroad. But this is part of their program. So what one of the problems, in, not just in Europe, is that people don't read party programs anymore. While I think that we should start reading again what, this, what people are writing in their programs, because it's quite relevant. So then, for the purity of French people, this is my understanding, so no citizenship for illegal migrants. In this case, was like some of the, uh, some of the things that some of the people voting for Trump, at least, uh, were saying. Uh, no double citizenship for the majority of people, uh, strict asylum policies. Uh, in this sense, it was quite uh, unclear what they, pro what they are proposing in their program, uh, but certainly they want to stop people before arriving. So if you are a refugee, so someone escaping from a dictatorship, uh, they want to make things so strict that you should apply in your, uh, in your own country. Now, if you escape from a country, going to, <laughs> to the police and saying, I want to go abroad, I mean, I don't think that is a good solution, but you know, at least uh, this is what they say. Patriotic employment. What is this patriotic employment? Uh, their proposal is actually quite uh, interesting, which, I mean, sh should be discussed, because all of this, according to them, should go into the Constitution. So it should be law. And usually you change these laws not with parliamentary laws, but with high court laws or with referendum and so on. So patriotic employment means that they want to, uh, to protect uh, local workers. And they basically want to say that if a French company, imagine this, is willing to hire me, they should pay more taxes. Despite the fact that I might be more skilled to do that job, but in any case, so this is a way to stop uh, people. Then social housing for French people, and which is uh, an issue in France, not teaching minority languages and cultures at school, but telling in history books the great history of the French nation. Now, they are not alone, of course. Germany, alternative for Germany, is a, part, is a party led by this, uh, this leader. Uh, and is a, uh, this is a movement which, even as I was saying before, even in the rich Germany, uh, there, were, there are movements which were initially anti-Euro, but then they became anti-immigrant, anti-Europe, and so on. And the, today, what is interesting is that a few weeks ago, uh, the, part, the, the main leadership said to move the party towards something which was in some ways more mainstream. But the party in Congress said, no, we need to move towards the extreme right even more. They are contesting election, of course. Uh, we have other movements like the Northern League, as you know, uh, which is now, uh, they are, I mean, this is what they try to do. They, they're trying to become a sort of national league. And especially in Rome, they're linked with Casa Pound. I don't know if you're familiar with Casa Pound, but Casa Pound is one of the hardliner uh, fascist movement. They call themselves fascist, even if some of my, my colleagues call them populist. I can't see why you have to call populist. Someone who is La Belle himself for the first time, I'm a fascist. Uh, and they are quite, sorry? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they, but they borrow also Che Guevara. I mean, uh, they, they, you know, there is everything. There is everything. If you if you visit their uh, their um, uh, their headquarter and so on. So uh, Casa Pound is a movement which is 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 having lots of interest abroad for from similar movement because Casa Casa Pound is is actually trying to mobilize and socialize activists in a very different way. So through music, 
through social housing, through uh, trying to help people, and so on. So they're not a party, uh, a classic party, but they are hardliners. Yeah. Uh, then we have Greece, as we know. Uh, last year in the, in the Slovakia parliament, we had neo fascists entering in parliament. These were people marching in, uh, in uh, almost black military uh, uniforms. 8% they enter in the party. Jobbik in, in the Netherlands, another hardline party, making Orban uh, looking like a sort of moderate Boy Scout. And uh, we have Pegida in Germany, which is another short uh, little movement. So my question, and in this I disagree with Federico sometimes. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I'm not sure that this is really liberal and democratic as we, uh, as we used to know. And certainly for me, it's not new. And here is, are the problems or, of interpretation. So new. I read, for example, in this week's Difesa della Razza, fascist publication of the 30s, well, you know, there are some things which are exactly the same. Some words like uh, religion against mixed weddings, as Marine Le Pen is saying, unity of Italian race against cosmopolitanism, as uh, the Front National is saying, uh, Jewish, also other people are different from, from Italian, blacks are not Italian. So it's a sort of, you know, carbon copy, keeping in mind the different historical context in the war years and today. Uh, also, what has been known as the populist radical right, I don't use populism as a category because in my view it's misleading. Uh, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, the leader of the party, the, the one that for many media is different from the young daughter Marine Le Pen, the modern, the proto-modern, the post-modern, I don't know what to call her. Uh, well, Marine Le Pen is, was using exactly the same terminology. It was not called national priority, it's called national preference. Now, the difference between priority and preference is not so huge, according to me, especially if you're reading uh, their, their program. So exactly the same terminology, but she's, good, she's a, a woman, she's uh, young, she's not so violent in the expression, but you know, what is the new year? And this is, you know, uh, once more some of the things in the, in the national um, uh, priority and in, in the policy of the movement, especially what is not said, but what some researchers, what some journalists have been able to find out talking with militants, which is different than. Uh, so, why is the far right here to stay? I think that there are, firstly, confusion and the media is helping them. Is helping them in a way that if now we open a newspaper, and I think that Trump election has, has, you know, has made things even harder because now everyone in Europe, not everyone, but you know, we have started using nativist parties and so on, outright uh, and so on. And even you know, now that there are an election, this is the European Trump. I think that you know, it's, there is lots of confusion because Trump came later actually, so maybe he's borrowing if he's borrowing from someone. So. First, confusion. Second, uh, in, in France, the use of national populism has been misleading completely because what French scholars have done for a long period was to use this national populism, which was linked with the idea that in the interwar years, France was immune because France is a great country, exceptional uh, democracy is extremely strong in France. While in reality, this has led some scholars, mainstream scholars, some point to call the Front National not even extra but to call it national populist. There are also some academic interpretations. This is a book published by Cass Mudde. He's one of the main uh, experts today. And Mudde is one of the promoters of this populist radical right. Uh, for example, this is what he writes in this very recent book. Uh, the, the, the rise of the populist uh, radical right started in the mid-80s. Well, this is, uh, as Federico is saying, you know, do your own works before writing something. The Italian social movement was how we consider itself, uh, uh, Mude consider it a sort of uh, populist radical right, what was in the rise since the 1946, 7, 8, uh, uh, you know, and, and so on. So why not consider it, well, Italy is out of the, uh, of the European Union, of Europe or so, or as Federico is saying, we are Latin, so much more closer to Latin America than to Northern Europe. This is a huge, huge mistake, also because the Front National was uh, fully uh, following the Italian social movement when it was established in 1972. 
then uh, democratic, I already said that for me is problematic, and then this is the definition that Mude does in using populist radical right. Nativism, authoritarianism, populism. Once more, I don't see anything new in this. What is leading is, in my view, a sort of legitimization of the entire system. Now, why is staying, and I'm concluding with a couple of uh, few slides. So, uh, Trump election, not because Trump is helping them, but because they believe that they can use Trump or some of the people close to Trump to legitimize. So if he was able to win, we are able to win. This is in, uh, in, uh, in England. Uh, Brexit, because Brexit has been, a, 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 let's say, a show of English nationalism coming back. And so they are all using this rhetoric. Referenda everywhere in Europe. Uh, Putin. Putin, I was discussing with him yesterday night about the links, and you know, what is known today is that Putin is funding, or oh, the Russian establishment, but maybe Putin itself, is funding some of these parties. This is Marine Le Pen in uh, Moscow, uh, her father in Moscow previously. This is the uh, Northern League, Northern League again, Moscow, uh, banners, uh, also little movements are with them. Maybe even Casa Pound is getting money. Uh, Nigel Farage, say, I admire Vladimir Putin. These are the links. I, I suggest you to look at this website, Tell Mama UK, because it's a quite interesting project. And naturally, there are some links which go beyond the, uh, the Europe itself. So Putin is funding them because they are against economic sanctions to Russia because some of them would like to destroy the European Union and they want to build a federation with Moscow inside it. So, it's money and destroying the European Union. Austerity, in my view, is the last point to be fully considered because austerity has been dismantling some of the Europe which we used to know, which was welfare. Now, imagine someone at the bottom of the social ladder hearing newspaper and politicians saying all the time, you, we need to cut the, the uh, welfare, uh, healthcare, education. And then I, I used to read newspapers telling there are too many immigrants, too many immigrants. I mean, psychological, why we should say that these are uh, people, uh, you know, uh, non-intelligent, stupid, and so on. They simply try to defend their interests, even if they don't, maybe, maybe it's fake, but you know, in any case, that the fault is mostly of other politicians not telling eventually the truth. Greece, I just want to give you this, uh, showing this. These are people in Greece at the edge of poverty. Now, why being surprised that traditional parties lost all Greek elections? Uh, Golden Dawn, the party of uh, the, the, the neo fascist party in parliament became, again, the third party in Greece, despite having half of the leadership in prison. Prison, I mean, jailed. Uh, so, the answer, what has been said before, uh, by Alessandro as well, is like, what are national governments saying to this? Zero. Or wrong answers. Zero, because when they do something, they try to borrow from the far right. So, like to say, you know, no immigration, uh, we try to do this, but they only legitimize this. The answer from the European institution, also because of lack of publicity in what they do, is zero again. Zero again. There is this Italian government report published last year uh, from the uh, Ministry of Economy in Italy, which was about economy itself. But the first two pages, incredibly, in my view, were analyzing the situation in Europe, saying nationalism is on the rise, we need to do something. Uh, people are perceiving that only the richest countries are benefiting from it. The answer for the for European Commission, zero. Like, you know, the last EU member state and not a founding fathers was doing this. So, we are closed. Okay. <laughs>